Then here we have the back of the tender. It says 614, then under it you may notice NHRR. That stands for New Hope Railroad. Um, this engine was kept for a long time before she ran the 1990 trips in New Hope and Ivyland at the New Hope Railroad, and, well, New Hope and Ivyland Railroad. So the NHRR means New Hope Railroad. And here we go. This is where all the action started. We're inside the cab of Chesapeake and Ohio number 614 with the firebox doors open. Inside, we can maybe try to look. That's the inside of the firebox. You're looking at the grates at the bottom and the firebox. This is similar, it's just a little tool, similar to a hoe. And it can, you see in the bottom where it's in the firebox, if you had any clunkers you had to kind of break up, you would just kind of move this around, beat them up, beat, you know, push it back and forth to break up some clunkers. But this is inside the firebox of number 614. This here is the stoker itself that comes from the tender into the engine. The stoker screw would spin and force the, the coal to be shot into the firebox because an engine this big as you know, there's no way you'd be able to shovel coal fast enough. Plus take care of the water and boiler and everything else that the fireman does. So uh, although he did have controls, over how fast the stoker went, uh, the stoker did the work. He just had to control it, which was, believe me, more than enough work. Then here we look at some of the control valves on the engineer side of the locomotive. This is the engineer's side. First of all, we'll go up a little tiny bit. Hope you guys can see. We have three gauges. One that monitors the stoker pressure, which basically means how fast or how strong the stoker is moving to uh, produce coal into the boiler. And then the big white one on the right is the overall engine boiler pressure. We normally ran at 255 PSI which means pounds per square inch. There are three safety valves on this engine that kicked off at 256, 258, and 260. The, the 256 was the smaller, 258 was bigger, and the 260 was a humongous safety. So it came equipped with three safety valves. Then of course, what these controls here do is this regulates the steam that blows the coal around inside the boiler or inside the firebox i'm sorry um so you didn't have a huge pile of coal in one section and nothing in another you had a nice even fire and what these valves did is over here you have left back left front center then you have right front and right back. So the fireman would take a look inside the firebox or look through the holes to see what the fire would look like and depending on what he had to do he would either increase or decrease steam pressure into the boiler to kind of blow the coal around but that's what these valves all did. They uh, pushed steam into the firebox thus moving the coal around as needed to have a nice even fire and provide really good steam for the engineer. Then here, on both sides, the engineer and the fireman side, you had three pedals on each side. You, you didn't use your feet with these. Uh, there was a long, uh, like, a, like a long rod. And actually, I can show you the rod that does it. Here it is right here. This part here would go on top of the, the three. And here is the rod itself. You would stick you would stick this rod and this 
would actually go into these and you would shake it back and forth to shake the grates to also help break up any clunkers or if you had to dump a little bit of the fire that's in fact what that would do then here's everybody's favorite part of the locomotive right now we're in the engineer seat of 614 as you see to the upper top right we have uh, back head pressure and uh, the air brakes it's brake pressure we have of course the boiler pressure the back pressure gauges then everybody knows this right here is the throttle you would squeeze that and the more you would pull up the more the throttle would open that basically kind of controlled uh, the, the uh, speed of the locomotive. Of course, down in here we have the Johnson's bar, which basically meant forward, neutral, reverse. We have some braking mechanisms. And right here, although uh, I, I'm, I'm not too up on very, very modern cab controls, um, at the time, keep in mind, the last time this locomotive ran was in the 1990s. At that time, this was up to FRA standards. This was the cab controls that uh, Jersey Transit required us to put in, along with those ditch lights in the front. Um, these were, of course, added. It didn't, it didn't come built with the locomotive. Um, I'm sure these are antiquated uh, and ha would have to be updated when this engine runs again. And um, yes, I did say when this engine runs again. These would have to be changed, but at the time, these were the most modern uh, pieces of equipment. The, uh, you know, cab control that monitored everything on a locomotive. Oh, and one, one quick thing I just noticed, I missed earlier. That little green button down there is for the sanders. Everybody knows, uh, you know, when you look at a steam locomotive down in front of the, each driving wheel, you have the sanders. Um, that basically turns the sanders on and off. You push the button and the sanders go on. And that's what that little green button right there is for. Now we take a look in the back of the tender. One of the grates is pulled up. And deep down and right in there would be the stoker. It's like a giant corkscrew that spins around, driving coal up into the locomotive. And we pan up. The extra rods that were pulled off are being stored back there. Um, I guess some of the tarps had blown off, but they originally had it covered with tarps to help prevent rust. But um, they could still be cleaned up. But this is the back of the tender. Of course, there's no coal in it. And when this engine would run, the uh, coal bunker was eventually extended by Ross Rowland to accommodate longer distances, which is why he added what they call a B tank, which is an auxiliary water tender. Um, the the uh, stoker screw could not be extended, so at a point almost all the way back there, uh, somewhere around there, it, the stoker screw would stop so uh, there would usually be one or two guys back there kind of helping feed coal go down the pile into the stoker now as a safety measure of course you, you don't want to be walking around back there with this giant corkscrew spinning around so right in here these square little grates as the coal pile would go back further you would pull these grates forward to cover up the hole and cause a floor that would be safe to walk on. Otherwise, you would have a great big hole and a giant spinning uh, stoker, which would be quite dangerous if you ever lost your footing. And right behind 614 is what we would call either a heavyweight or a Madison in the O gauge world. This is actually a combine car. And um, I'm glad they have it painted up in this particular paint scheme. It is my favorite. And uh, as far as my O-gauge cons is for my Greenbriars, 612 and 614, this is the same color scheme that I have. 
So uh, I'm real glad to see uh, something in real life. This is the Chesapeake and Ohio combine car number 458. It does come equipped with six wheel trucks on each side. So this is a heavyweight class car. Of course, on one end, you would have the baggage door and compartment. And then as we go further down to the car, although it wouldn't be used primarily for passengers, there is a space that, uh, you know, some folks can sit. So thus, that's why we call it a combine car. It's partially passenger, partially baggage. And uh, this car is actually in pretty good shape. Then behind it, we have another CNO car. In the paint, same paint scheme, this car name is Gadshee's Tavern. I'll have to do a little research and see where I, what I can find out and where this car ran. But this car is called Gadshee's Tavern. And this is right behind the combine car. Then behind that is a Pullman car painted Chesapeake and Ohio. And this car is called City of Petoskey. Once again, I'm going to have to do some research and see what these two cars mean. But this car is the City of Petoskey. This is a more modern car, as you can tell by the shape of the car. It does have the same paint scheme, but it's much more modern car. And not only that, the previous two cars have had six wheel trucks. This car has a four wheel truck. So this is a more modern version. And this is behind the other two CNO cars. Then behind that, we have this car. I'm going to be honest, I don't know too much about it. If anybody recognizes it or knows some history about what this car was used for, please leave a comment. You can, I can always learn something new, but this car is behind it. Um, it definitely needs a little bit of help, uh, but that's okay. Nothing, nothing is unrepairable. It's um, not in that bad of shape. There's no, not a tremendous amount of rust. It just needs a little bit of a facelift and some tender loving care, but uh, this is a very cool looking car. Then behind it, we have two older passenger cars. One is a streamlined passenger car. The one behind it would be what we would call either a Madison or a heavyweight. And then behind that is another streamlined passenger car. Then way down there, right under the bridge is an old CSX caboose. And I got to tell you, if you ever get a chance to come down here, this is beautiful, beautiful country. Um, this is in Clifton Forge, and uh, I, I've been lucky enough to be here for three days, and uh, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to go home. It's that nice. This is a view of the mountains and what you see when you get down here. It is just beautiful, beautiful country. If you ever get a chance to come down here, and actually, um, I think it's only about 100 miles from Roanoke. So you could visit the Norfolk and Western Museum, as well as this museum in the same road trip, because they're only, um, I believe somebody told me like 100 miles away. So it's not far, uh, an hour and a half, maybe an hour and 45 minutes from here, I can get to Roanoke. I won't be able to do that this visit, but I'm hoping to get down to Roanoke probably not this summer but my goal is maybe next summer to extend this trip come back here and then from here go to Roanoke but this is the view of the countryside and it is just absolutely beautiful you can also stand on top of that bridge which does go over the main line and you can catch some photos or videos of trains going by from that bridge there's a great view Okay, the joke is on me. I mentioned something about Godshee's Tavern, 
After getting closer to the car, it's quite visible. It's Gadsby's Tavern. So, uh, oops on me. But uh, this is the tavern car called Gadsby's Tavern. Then on the track adjacent to 614, we have Chesapeake and Ohio number 5828. This is a GP7 locomotive. This engine has been cosmetically restored. I'm going to be real honest, it's in great shape. They've done a wonderful job. The paint looks terrific. It's just a really nice piece. This is the front end of the locomotive. Then we get to the cab. and then head back towards the back end of the locomotive. The paint on this is stunning. It is really, really a very nice piece. Then here they have a live steam locomotive that folks can ride on. It's actually not steam, but it is a diesel. It's CNO number 3044, painted in the Chessie system livery. Uh, this locomotive is very cool to see going around. Of course, behind it, you have the engineer seat. Behind it, you have a couple flat cars for some passengers. And of course, what's a train without a red caboose? This actually does a fairly large loop around the property. And it's very cool. The kids love to ride on this. If you ever get to come down here and see it in action, this train runs the entire time that the museum is open. Then here we have what we would call in the old gauge world, a Northeast caboose. This is owned by the Chesapeake and Ohio Historical Society. It is numbered number 3168, painted in the C&O for progress livery. It's a great looking caboose. Let's go take a look inside. Okay, wow, this is in fantastic shape. If it just had some air conditioning, I would have no problem staying here. This is the inside of that Northeast caboose. Of course, we have a chair here, some benches. All of the walls are painted very well, very well kept, very clean. The floors on this caboose are amazing. Look at that. This caboose has been restored and looks fantastic. Then we move a little bit deeper. And of course, if you go up the steps here and sit in the bench, that's where they have the cupola. And of course, depending on which way the caboose is going, you can either face that way, or if the caboose is going in the reverse direction, you could sit in the other one and face the opposite way. Then we go back and we have a furnace and a stove here. Some more benches and a chair. But um, I, I have to tell you, turning around, looking again, the restoration on this car is absolutely amazing. The floors are spotless. This car has really been done up very well. This is spectacular. Thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, wow, <laughs> what a heck of a road trip. Uh, took about seven hours to get there and uh, closer to eight to get back. Uh, I caught a little bit of bad weather and some traffic, but uh, it's all good. It was well worth it. I uh, traveled from Central Jersey down to Clifton Forge, Virginia to spend three days with 614 at the CNO Heritage Center. I want to thank you uh, to everybody at the Heritage Center. Uh, they, they really uh, treated me very well. They gave me full access to anything on the engine and basically anything on the property uh, that I wanted to check out. Um, if you're ever down in that area, please stop by and pay them a visit. Uh, they're a great bunch of people, and there's a lot of really cool things uh, down there to see. Um, I want to also thank the CNO Heritage Society uh, for uh, throwing in a couple things as well when uh, I was down there. 
So uh, it, w it was a great trip. I enjoyed it. Uh, like I said, it, I'm still excited. It was the first time I got to see the real 614 in, uh, oh gosh, 17, 18 years. So uh, it was a very enjoyable trip. And as you saw, I took my 614 to meet her big sister. So we had uh, the O-Gage 614 uh, actually sitting on the pilot as well as in the uh, engineer area uh, of the real 614. And, uh, you know, we, we don't get to do that too much with our models, uh, you know, having the model meet the real engine. But uh, it was a fun trip. The weather cooperated. Uh, I stayed at a, at a wonderful place called the uh, Red Lantern. It's actually right across the street from the uh, Heritage Center. You could walk there. Uh, they have a very, very first class place. It's very, very nicely run. Um, old style Virginia, but um, it, that's what's great about it. I mean, it was a fantastic trip. So I thank all of you for taking the trip with me. Uh, it was a lot of fun getting to see uh, my old friend 614 as well as meeting some new people while I was down there. and. Uh, one of my subscribers, uh, Gus, uh, stopped by. Uh, he traveled uh, just about two hours to meet up with me. So, uh, Gus, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to meet you, and uh, hopefully more to come. So thanks for watching today's video, everybody. As usual, if you're not a subscriber, please hit the subscribe button. Uh, it's actually one of the few things that are still free these days, but uh, hit the subscribe button. Uh, if you'd like to leave a comment, I like hearing from everybody. Uh, I listen to everybody, I listen to comments, suggestions, so hit the thumbs up, uh, leave a comment if you like, subscribe if you're not already, and uh, if you care to view, uh, thank you all for viewing this video, uh, it was a pleasure to bring to you, uh, I had a great time while I was down there. Thanks for checking it out everybody, take care and be safe.